you're tuned in to Can You Hear Me? Let's talk about mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. This is Can You Hear Me? Let's Talk About Mental Health. I'm your host, Stephanie Davis, and our guest for today is Dr. Sarah Yogiv. She is the author of A Couple's Guide to Happy Retirement and Aging, 15 Keys to Long-Lasting Vitality and Connection, which is now in its third edition. She is an experienced psychologist with over 30 years of practice helping individuals and couples struggling with depression, anxiety, and relationship issues. A former Northwestern University faculty member, she has published articles in acclaimed professional journals and has been featured as an expert on work-family balance on many radio stations and magazines like Newsweek, Time, Money, and USA Today. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Dr. Sarah Yogiv. Welcome to our show. Hi, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, likewise. We appreciate you joining us, Dr. Sarah. But why did you write this book? Uh, That's a great question. Thank you for asking me that. And it's um, basically several reasons that led me to write the book about retirement and aging. I guess sometimes the universe provides you some information, and uh, that's what happened for me. Uh, First of all, in my practice, I started getting increasing numbers of new clients that were in long-term and stable, happy marriages. But when one or both spouses retired, the marital tension and conflict reached new heights that caused them to seek marriage and counseling. So it was couples that started coming when one or both retired. Then a second component is that I started getting new individual clients that came to see me due due to depression. And when I started checking more uh, when the depression started, it uh, was evident that it started Um, sometimes after their retirement, they felt lost, they felt worthless, they felt confused and unclear about what's next for them. Additionally, I had a client herself, a therapist and in her 40s, and she asked me advice about what can she do regarding her parents. Uh, She said that Her her mother was a homemaker. Her father retired. And now she said, I have to do merit and counseling on a daily basis for them on the phone because they are fighting all the time and they are complaining about each other. So it became, and all of that was within a few, a short period of time that it happened. So it became very clear to me that those individuals and couples were not prepared for the emotional side of retirement and probably have not prepared for that, didn't plan. So when I suggested to the client that was a therapist that she would give her parents a book about psychological preparation for retirement, she told me, to my great surprise, that she can't find anything among all the many books on retirement that we see in bookstores. So, in fact, at that time, all the retirement book dealt with the financial aspect of retirement and completely neglected the importance of preparing for the psychological aspect of this life stage. Mm -hmm. Um, Since she knew that in my previous academic life, my area of expertise was the way people combine work life and family life, she said, Sarah, why won't you write about this subject? So I gave this idea some thought and realized that it is indeed the natural continuation of my previous area of work, family, 
uh, balance. I guess mm-hmm. if before I was talking about dual career couples, mm-hmm. so it was the impact of work on family life. Mm-hmm. Now it's the impact of lack of work on family life. So that is how the idea for the book came about. I'm very happy that the book is now in its third edition. Each one is better than the previous one and that people are benefiting from it uh, as far as I can tell from the feedback that they get. Well, that, that's great. And, and that's one thing that some of us don't think about. You, you, as you previously mentioned, that people talk about the financial aspects of retirement, but not right. the psychological aspect of how it impacts the individual or the couple that's <laughs> going into that stage of life. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Right. So what are frequent mistakes that people make uh, regarding retirement? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, I would like to mention two uh, frequent, uh, I would call it misconception. Okay. People often uh, make when we come to retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> there is one on a personal level uh, that people often mistakenly believe, I don't need to plan for retirement because I know how to do leisure. I had vacation before. Hmm. And as long as I have enough money, I have my health, everything would be fine. Hmm. That's how what many people believe and maybe financial planner uh, uh, maybe is foc- are focusing too much on that. Hmm. However, what people are not realizing that when retirement can be one third or one fourth or even one third of one life, it would feel very different than a one month vacation. In chapter one of my book, I discuss the different stages of retirement. There is the initial honeymoon stage when people feel freedom to do, oh, I can do what I want, when I want it, go to bed at 3 a.m., wake up at 11, <laughs> do different projects, travel, clean the attic, put photo in the album. Mm-hmm. But there's a great sense of freedom, and people are usually quite happy in that stage. But that stage usually lasts anywhere between 6 to 18 months, and it is very, very often followed by what I call the disenchantment stage. Mm -hmm. And disenchantment stage is the one where people feel lost, purposeless, confused. The individual client that I mentioned earlier of why I wrote the book, they came to see me, were indeed in that uh, stage. Mm -hmm. And what research is indicating is that one-third of retirees experienced depression during the first two years of their retirement. Mm -hmm. People who didn't plan and prepare psychologically for retirement are very surprised when they get into the disenchantment stage. They even criticize themselves for not being happy. And that self-criticism increased their depression. Mm -hmm. I fondly remember a client that called me and said, Dr. Yogev, I'm flunking retirement. It was so funny the way he said it. And he was very upset with himself about it. This was a very successful executive, used to be in charge of a large group of employees. He was financially comfortable. He had a stable marriage, a loving adult children and grandchildren, and he could not figure out why he's suddenly feeling so miserable had no clue why his beloved golf game that he enjoyed so much in the past is no more, no longer enjoyable. Mm. So people need to think about what will make them fulfilled and happy during retirement. Mm. A plan for the psychological aspect of that them, for themselves. So that's the first misconception, which is on a personal level. Mm. There is a second misconception which is lack of awareness of the impact of retirement on marriages. In the same way that the birth of the first child changes marital dynamic, retirement has a very similar effect, and marital dynamic needs to be renegotiated. For instance, time together and apart, division of housework, allocation of money 
to different activities or people or f- time with family and friends, all that needs to be reviewed, discussed, and if needed, changed. Now, what we know that both, again from research, is that both gender, men and women alike, report in the first two to three years of retirement low marital satisfaction and higher level of conflict. In order to avoid this, it's important, again, to plan psychologically ahead for both the personal and the marital changes that are natural process of the transition to retirement. And I think that reading my book, if I can mention, is a good one because I focus on different aspects that uh, need to be addressed. At the end of each chapter, there are some questions that people can ask themselves. I give example that some people uh, of clients and people that are interviewed uh, that can help them relate to that. And from what I know, it's quite helpful for that psychological preparation. So I hope that that helps. Yes, that's good. That's really good to know. Now, I, given the given these extraordinary times that we're dealing with, with the, pan, the health pandemic and we're dealing with uh, civil unrest and we've got uh, an election season, as I would put mm-hmm. it, that's going on right now. How do you think has, uh, that the coronavirus has impacted seniors? Oh, uh, the impact of the corona, of COVID-19 or corona, whatever you want to call it, on retiree uh, is um, much more severe than on younger population. Uh, and I, I think it's very important to look uh, into that, whether they are retired or not retired. Uh, and there are three general reasons or categories uh, that can explain why their impact is more severe. Um, So people over 65 years old face multiple difficulties uh, during COVID more than younger people do. The first one has to do with general anxiety about health. I guess everyone at any age uh, has some stress uh, about health and not wanting to be infected, to be careful, even though for younger people when they're infected, The consequences are not so severe, but they still would prefer to be healthy. And we all know that the COVID-19 impact the elderly more severely than the younger one. So also, as people age, they are more likely to have other health issues related to aging that makes them more vulnerable and more difficult to cope with COVID. So it's not a surprise that seniors' anxiety level about COVID is higher than the general concern uh, that the general concern that younger people have. And indeed, I just saw a study by uh, Baycrest and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. It was led by Dr. Linda May and Dr. Ben Wamenslan, and they found that one third of people below age 65 experience depression, and high stress since the pandemic started, even if they were not directly infected and exposed to COVID. But these numbers are much, much higher among older adults who are more vulnerable to COVID and have more difficulty recovering from it. And indeed, there are reports that as the pandemic continues and we don't have a clear end in sight, prescription for Anti-depression and anti-anxiety are soaring, and in some places are really uh, we see scarcity of them, and that's among younger population, and definitely even more so among the older population. Mm-hmm. So that's the first reason, you know, mm-hmm. the heightened anxiety uh, about health. Mm-hmm. The second one has to do with anxiety or concern about finance. Unemployment rate uh, among um, the elderly um, is higher than among younger people. There is, uh, in April 2020, 
uh, it was reported it was a 15.4% for worker age 65 and older compared to only 13% for younger workers. And in August, uh, there is an investment news report that say, showed that among people who are 55 to 70 years old, nearly 5 million, which is 70% of that age group, lost their job since the pandemic started in March. And another report uh, is saying that they are not likely to go back to work because those, some of those jobs were probably lost forever. Mm. The reason for the higher number of seniors who lost their job is that many older adults had what I call bridge employment. It's again also a term that I talk about in my book. It's temporary work. They finish working in some main work, and now they want to work a little bit longer until they reach a full retirement benefit or until they supplement more saving. But it was something that was temporary, a bridge to something else. Mm -hmm. Many of these jobs uh, were held by women and people of color, and they had to be done face-to-face, so they cannot be done remotely. And that's another reason to why they lost it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I found out that 68 million say that COVID has altered their retirement timing and plans. For some people, the early retirement is impacting them financially for the rest of the years. For instance, if they're not able to work until they reach maximum retirement benefit and they were forced to retire early, so for the rest of the years, they'll get lower uh, pension or payment. Uh, other people are fearful that they don't have enough saving altogether. So the phenomena of people who are forced to retire earlier than anticipated is called forced retirement. And in my book, in Chapter 5, I talk about forced or involuntary retirement. It can be due to health reasons. Let's say your health deteriorated and you can't work anymore. You have back pain and in your work, if it's a physical labor, you have to carry stuff um, or your vision deteriorated and you cannot do stuff on the computer as much. So one reason is because of health that you didn't anticipate that will deteriorate your uh, retiring earlier than what you would have liked to and planned. Another reason is retirement uh, unexpectedly because of family needs. Let's say this is very often the case for women who have to retire in order to take care of a sick uh, family member or an elderly relative, and that prevents them from also continuing the work. The, but the most common cause and, uh, for forced retirement, the most difficult one to deal with, is when it is due to employment reason. For instance, the job was eliminated due to a buyout or some other organizational changes. Or you were fired. Or you were offered an unexpected early retirement package that was too hard to resist or to refuse, or if you wouldn't take it, it would you won't be able to get such good benefit in the future, but you were too young, you were not expecting to retire. So regardless of the reason for the false retirement, in all these scenarios, individuals who retired involuntarily experience poorer adjustment to retirement lower level of life satisfaction, lower levels of well-being than those who retired voluntarily and planned to do it when they did it. So when the retirement is forced, particularly when it is unexpected, people feel lack of control over their life, and that can lead to anxiety, depression, and stress. Mm -hmm. Like you are not in charge or have little control over your life has immense negative impact on self-esteem, 
an emotional positive outlook. In addition, people who retard involuntarily do not get the benefit of enjoying the honeymoon stage that I described earlier, mm-hmm. um, and that is fun. <laughs> so these people that have, are forced to retirement lack adequate time to plan and prepare for retirement. They often also have obstacles to new opportunities and not enough information or time to consider alternative that will help them make good decisions about, let's say, social security, health insurance, or other domain of their life, sometimes even um, moving to a new housing or relocation. And they have to make decisions in non-optimal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So what we can see that all these factors that I mentioned about losing employment unexpectedly and involuntarily and cause more difficult transition to retirement are true for older adults who lose their unemployment due to the COVID. So they increase the financial thing because of the COVID and causing them to have a forced retirement, which is so much less desirable. Uh, this uh, health pandemic has really impacted a lot of us, and uh, and I am concerned health wise, uh, definitely with seniors because of just the nature of you know you're not able to go out as much, and the yeah, fact that you know some may have uh, in terms of health pre existing conditions, and you know they're either already in the process of you know preparing for retirement or they're already at that, that life stage and it's just... Uh, yeah, you, you were tapping on the third reason uh, that I want to bring about why is mm-hmm. the COVID impacting seniors so much more severely mm-hmm. and that is social isolation. Mm-hmm. And one is working, you still interact with colleagues, even if it's on Zoom, <laughs> there is right. some interaction. Right. But if you're retired, particularly if you're forced to retire, you don't have uh, those interactions anymore. And as you mentioned, you can't meet with friends and with families. It's curbed. Visiting grandchildren Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, much more serious because, you know, we know that kids can, you know, transmit the virus. So what it's causing is... Uh, social isolation that is leading to loneliness. Mm -hmm. And it is estimated that loneliness in adult age 70s and older is between 25 to 29 percent during COVID. Now studies, what we know before COVID, they clearly indicate that social isolation that leads to feeling of loneliness Uh, is related to higher mortality level. Physical and mental health risks for isolation, uh, sorry, of isolation and loneliness are twice that of obesity and are similar to the negative impact of smoking and alcohol use disorder. Loneliness can cause depression, which weaken the immune system. So in summary, I can say that the combination of the anxiety about one's health, the financial concern about those that lost their job or other financial benefit, and the social isolation loneliness is causing greater difficulties for seniors during this pandemic time. Yeah. It's oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, to be concerned about it. But I don't want us to lose hope. I think yes. there are things that people can do. Too. Yes, yes. What are, are some best practices that you could share with our listeners regarding what to do in planning for retirement or if they're already at the retirement life stage? 
Yeah. And that will help them better cope, uh, whether with COVID or with retirement, because the two can be linked. Mm -hmm. So COVID is basically giving people, uh, some people who are not retirement before the pandemic, a sense of what retirement will be like. Mm -hmm. So it would be great to use this time and start thinking uh, yourself, discussing with your partner, and planning emotionally for it. COVID also forces couples to face their differences as they are stuck at home. Now, we all know that eventually COVID is going to be over and life will go back to a more normal pattern. So I really strongly suggest that people will use this opportunity to prepare psychologically for the retirement years that are lying ahead of them. And here are some suggestions for what they can do. Uh, First of all, ask yourself, how do you want to spend your time? How much time do you want to be alone? How much time with your spouse? How much doing what? Create an ideal schedule. What is an ideal schedule for you for a day or for a week or for a month? How often do you want to see family and friends? Remember, there are 168 hours in the week. You need some for sleep. But how do you want the rest of them to be divided? Remember, there are no right or wrong answers, only preferences. So be ready to have disagreement or maybe even surprises when you and your spouse or partner will discuss this topic. Now, when you're talking with your spouse, Work toward finding a compromise that will take care of your individual needs as well as your partner. Make sure that there is a balance between what I call the togetherness separation continuum. Each partner needs need to be met as much as possible. And I want to give a few examples. Uh, a couple where the husband was working long hours and was used to spend all his free time, leisure time with his wife. When COVID hit, he is very happy. But prior to COVID, when I saw them, she was very unhappy because she wanted to have some time alone without him. But then he was feeling very abandoned uh, by her and um, didn't know what to do with himself without her. So they really had to start working toward finding a compromise. But then with COVID happened, she's home with him. So the issue is a little bit off the table, but it will come back to haunt them. Mm -hmm. Another example is a couple that I worked with in the past. Uh, He was a consultant traveled all over the world, all over the United States. He was also a very introverted person. So when during the week he was not at home, uh, the wife knew that that's her life and she felt somewhat abandoned, emotionally abandoned. But then when he came back for the weekend, they really focused on each other and um, she was very content during the weekend. She expected that when he will retire, it would be as their weekends are. And he'll be engaged with her and be very happy about it in the same way that she's happy being engaged with him. Guess what? A little bit after retirement, he wanted his individual time. He's an introvert. He's Mm -hmm. an introvert. He wanted to do projects on his own without Mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. She felt very, very abandoned because she expected it would be like the weekends that he used to have. Mm -hmm. So they had to work through a compromise that would take care of each partner needs. And again, you see, there are no right or wrong answer. It's what is working for that specific couple. Mm -hmm. So you need to be prepared to negotiate also other domains of your life, not just the time. Another domain that very frequently is causing friction is division of housework and money allocation. So I want to talk about them. Okay. 
So uh, because the financial uh, change because of COVID, it might be a good idea to review your financial portfolio. And in Chapter 7, I discuss at length the psychology of money, as I call it, uh, which is different than the amount of money uh, that you have. Uh, so you need to evaluate if there was a change in your values and preference about money. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more here. There are people that they tend to call the savers. The savers are people for whom money means security. And that's why they like to save. That is in contrast to the spender for whom money means freedom and fun. So if you have the two of them married, you can imagine that that can cause sometimes questions Mm -hmm. and conflict. But now after COVID or after retirement, when the financial situation is slightly different, you need to review it. Some saver, particularly because of COVID less money, become even more fearful and want to save even more and become, according to the spouses, really misers. On the other hand, the spender who wants fun when uh, COVID would be over would like to go more on fancy vacation or go to fancy restaurant or whatever, and then can create some friction. So you need to be aware of what are your values and preferences about money and create something that will work for both uh, spouses. So that's the issue of the money. Mm -hmm. The issue of housework is another domain that needs to be addressed. On the most basic level, buying groceries, cooking, doing laundry, shoveling snow, preparing income tax form, are either daily or weekly or seasonal chores that need to be done on a regular basis so the household will function properly. But this function can also have additional meaning that goes beyond the mundane. They can express caring. Like if you cook a meal and you're cooking your spouse's favorite dish or you buy flowers, but you buy your, uh, your spouse's favorite flowers, it has a different meaning. It, not just doing the function of the task of the housework, but it has an additional caring message. It can also express control. Like if you need to buy, I don't know, cheese or something or peanut butter, and instead of buying the brand name that your spouse prefer, you buy the one that's on sale that is generic and you exercise your control about it, particularly if you are savers. So um, it kind of like annoys the other partner that you are controlling because you went grocery shopping, you're controlling and doing what you want versus taking into consideration what the other spouse wants. Hmm. So it can be control, it can be caring, but it also means that you're contributing your fair share to the overall functioning of the household. Mm. Now, over time, most couples establish their own division of these duties according to their availability, skills, preferences, and what they consider fair. What is fair for one couple can be not fair for another couple. Mm -hmm. Uh, But (coughs) (coughs) I'm sorry. No problem. Often, women carry the lion's share for the cooking, laundry, cleaning, which are the daily or the weekly chores. And on the other hand, men tend to do the more masculine chores, like the shoveling snow, the yard work, home repairs. And those chores that are more seasonal and less frequent than the feminine chores um, are not happening all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, when retirement happened, it upset the established pattern. Now, COVID is doing the same disruption. 
even for people that still work, they work from home and do not go from the, to the office, so they are more available at home. So it is much more extreme when one or both spouses are at home more than they used to before COVID, and the division of housework needs to be reevaluated. Otherwise, it can cause much friction. Very often, women expect their partners to increase their participation in the daily chores as they have more free time and are more available at home now. Mm -hmm. This is particularly apparent among couples that the husband retired before the wife did. When the husband is willing to increase his participation and there is agreement on which chores he will do, marital conflict and friction is minimal. However, if the husband feels that doing housework is incompatible with his sense of masculinity, as it is sometimes for men from the older generation, he might feel uncomfortable or even humiliated and therefore resist and will try to preserve the old status quo. The wife might experience that resistance as inconsideration, lack of caring for her burden. I want to give an example, for instance. Okay. Uh, she came back from work. Uh, he is not working anymore. And she asked him uh, to take the clothes out of the dryer and to also set the table for dinner so when she come home, that would be done. Guess what? She's coming home, mm-hmm. watching TV. Mm-hmm. Forgot about the clothes in the dryer. Did not set the table. So now the clothes in the dryer need to be ironed, more work for her. She needs to do a setting and everything. And, and she's annoyed and upset. Mm-hmm. So we can see how these small items, meaningless item we think of houseware can uh, cause friction. I have another example of she always wanted him to be more involved in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know what, I will start cooking. I will develop it as a new hobby. But he expects if he's cooking, she will clean after him. And it was so much mess. All the items were out and said, you know what? Don't cook. It's too much work. (laughs) Uh, In place, or, you know, to clean after you, that I prefer, you know, doing it. For another couple, when he started cooking, she felt very annoyed because she was very proud of her cooking. And she really felt like he's, stepping on her turf wow. and didn't like that, you know, he's invading her domain. Another couple, he was a, she was a, never forget that, she was an artist. He was a quality control engineer. Mm-hmm. So he was looking for projects to do in the house and <laughs> came upon the pantry and decided to organize the pantry alphabetically. <laughs> to him she was furious and she feel <laughs> this loving gesture of him trying to organize it was a complete intrusion into her sphere mm-hmm. so those examples that we laugh about can cause a lot of pain and yes. to couple yes and they need to be addressed mm-hmm. um, so how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you reorganize the division of labor? All that need to be addressed uh, for your retirement. And you need to try to avoid power struggles because they tend to lower marital satisfaction. Mm-hmm. You need to hear each other's point of view and understand why these items uh, is important. Uh, psychologically for that person, you know, one couple uh, that I work with, she was uh, leaving her mugs all over the house uh, by her computer, on the TV, on the counter. He tended to 
wake up earlier than she did. And when you would wake up in the morning uh, and see mugs and plates everywhere, he felt like his life is not in order. You know, he mm-hmm. doesn't have a, a safe haven at home. So before, when he was just complaining to her, you know, you left it here and you left it there, she experienced him as nagging and criticizing her. But when she realized how much it impact his sense of comfort and his sense he deserved to have a self, safe, safe at home, she was much more willing before she was going up to bed to go over the house and collect all the items that she left through the day mm-hmm. and put it in the dishwasher or in the sink so it won't trouble him. Mm-hmm. So this is like a tiny example that shows that you can't just argue by the items, but you need to understand what is the emotional, psychological meaning that the item means to you. Like for him, it meant clutter and it doesn't have a safe place. For her, it meant freedom to go about life, you know, if she want to. So by being more considerate of each other needs on whatever domain it is, you will be much better able to enjoy your golden years together. Mm. Now, there are things that you can do also on a personal level, Mm -hmm. not only from the couple's level, but from the personal level. Studies have shown us that we can control how we age. 70% of physical aging and about 50% of mental aging is determined by our lifestyle the choices we make on a daily basis. So here are a few things that you can do in order to age successfully and enjoy your retirement at your age. The first one, and it's important even more so during COVID, is have a growth mindset. See opportunities for change ahead rather than feeling that you are stuck with things the way they are. Mm. If you see aging as a series of aches, pain, decline, things that you cannot do anymore, you'll see more of just that. But on the other hand, if you believe that you are in control of your life, you will create a life that thrives in spite of all the inconveniences and the challenges. COVID is also an example of how having a long-term view is helpful. Life experience of senior can foster confidence to see themselves as weathering this storm rather than submitting to negativities of doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And remember that throughout your entire uh, retirement. You also need to make sure that you have intellectual stimulation as well as physical activities. Regular exercise is possible at all time, even during COVID time. There are many classes you can do online. You can walk outside. You can absolutely control the diet at all times that you are, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. But just exercising for one hour or eating healthy um, is not enough if you're a couch potato and watch stupid shows on TV the rest of the day, you have to fill the day with activities that are enjoyable, Mm -hmm. that keep your mind moving and engaged. Listen to lectures on YouTube on topics that are of interest to you. Read books. Get involved with projects. I don't know, like um, going into your family history or family tree, photography, whatever is of interest to you, but get into projects that would feel like time is going by quickly, that helps you get into what it's called a stage of flow when you mm-hmm. said, oh my God, it's been two hours. It feels like, you know, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you need to find purpose and meaning in your life in retirement. And in chapter three of the book, I discuss the importance of this topic. You need to feel that your life matters and 
feeling that your life matter is as essential to one health as food and water are. Fill your life with things and activities that matter to you, that include also doing something for others. It doesn't have to be something big like solving uh, world hunger or poverty, but it is helpful when it has positive impact on someone else. Of course, you can be helpful to family member, but also to other people. I am a big supporter of volunteering because it's a good opportunity to achieve that often. It gives you and allows you also social interaction with other people that share your view of what's important and contribute to the welfare of others. So as I call it, engage as you age. And that brings me now to the social network and be socially engaged. That's why volunteering is helpful because it helps you doing something good for others as well as be with others. And again, I'm relying on research that is showing us again and again that interaction with other people is a key element to having a happy and healthy retirement. It improves well-being and even can boost our immune system, particularly For people that are more of extrovert, they need it much more. It's like for them, it's water, air. Mm -hmm. So in summary, I would like to end by emphasizing again the importance of psychological planning for retirement. Individual and couples need to prepare psychologically for this life stage. And that is the reason that I wrote the book. And you can consult the book, of course. Be aware that probably are going to be times that are difficult to personally and also for the marriage and you'll have mixed feelings. You might have friction. But disagreement and conflict with your partner are not necessarily a bad sign of a bad relationship because you can come to a compromise and you need to revisit issues as They come, and it's a key to continue to have a great relationship, enjoying your golden years, and have even a better relationship with your partner that you had during your working year, because you have more time together and can listen to each other. And if you had a good relationship before, there is no reason why it won't even get better now. So as a call... I'm borrowed the term that Marian Osher is using, and it's called take care of your happiness portfolio as you do care for your financial portfolio. Mm-hmm. Maybe see this COVID time as an opportunity to do the planning for retirement if you haven't done it before because you have the time to do it, or if you did have a plan, reevaluate it and see if it still will apply. But be prepared. The pandemic will be over, and your retirement, your marriage, will get stronger if you do what you need to plan for it and find good compromises. Hmm. Words to live by. I like that. Take care of your happiness portfolio. Yeah. Hmm. And I hope that when I weave together the impact of COVID and kind of did the similarities to retirement, uh, because in both situations, we are more together, more at home, uh, with less things to do, that it's helpful for people uh, to that are maybe listening to it now during COVID uh, to learn from that also for the long-term time that will be after COVID. Yes. Now, Dr. Sarah, how is it that our listeners can connect with you? Oh, I have a website, sarahyogev.com. They can email me, sarahyogev at yahoo.com, and they can call my office, which is Mm 847-470-1925. All of that is on my website. Okay. All right. We will... Share that information with our listeners. Make sure that that is posted along with the podcast. Well, 
Well, Dr. Sarah, we appreciate you being our guest today. There's a, a lot of information that was uh, very helpful and informative, and we appreciate the examples that you gave. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Dr. Sarah Yergev, for as far as our guest for Ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from our podcast guest, Dr. Sarah Yagev. She is the author of A Couple's Guide to Retirement to Happy Retirement and Aging, 15 Keys to Long-Lasting Vitality and Connection. Previous books that she's written, For Better or Worse, But Not for Lunch, Making Marriage Work in Retirement, and A Couple's Guide to Happy Retirement. This is Can You Hear Me? Let's talk about mental health. Thanks for listening to the Can You Hear Me podcast. Be sure to visit MIPPLLC.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and find out more information about us. Until next time. Thank you.